Juan Gonzalez is actually a popular YouTuber uh, who goes by the name That Was Epic. So Mr. Was Epic specializes in giveaways, uh, filming the results in candid, cash in, uh, candid camera fashion. He actually walks around giving away laptop computers, cars. Uh, in, in this video, Juan stands outside stores dressed as Santa Claus, Juan de Claus, as he says, uh, giving people stacks of cash to pay for their Christmas shopping. The results are awkward, <laughs> but inspiring. And, and, and even emotional. I mean, some people, sure, the video goes on for a bit, and some people just take the money and kind of keep walking, but most are genuinely grateful, overwhelmed. Some people even ask, why? Why are you doing this? But Juan just hustles off, gives more money away to more people. It is a good question, though. Why would anybody stand outside a store giving away stacks of cash on Christmas? Now, to be sure, during any other day of the year, that might not make any sense at all. It barely makes sense on Christmas, <laughs> but it does. You see, Christmas tends out to bring out the best in us. And that's what the holiday is all about. This is the season of giving. I've been thinking a lot about generosity uh, this Christmas season. I'm, I am grateful, genuinely grateful, that our world has at least one month of the year in which it is sort of culturally expected to be generous. Uh, whether it's giving gifts to loved ones or, or making donations to the Salvation Army or making end of donations to church or adopting needy families, Christmas is sort of the holiday on which we collectively decide to at least try generosity. In a world as selfish as ours, at least we have Christmas. But I've been thinking about generosity at a deeper level too. You see, for Christians, Christmas is about the birth of Jesus, Jesus Christ, right. On Christmas, we remember the arrival of Jesus into the world, his incarnation as a, as a human being like us. Uh, we remember the story of Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem uh, to, give, you know, to participate in the census, but finding no room in the inn and giving birth to a poor child in, in a little manger. We remember the angels who appeared to the, to the shepherds in the sky and, and the, uh, the wise men who came from the east to worship the Savior. That's the Christmas story. Maybe you know it. But sometimes I think that we get lost in the details of the Christmas story and we forget what lies behind it. What lies behind Christmas? The generosity of God lies behind the holiday. The reason we have Christmas is because the God we worship is good and kind and giving. The prophets anticipated this. When Isaiah, the prophet, looked into the future and foretold the arrival of Jesus, he said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is what? Given. And even Jesus himself says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus is God's gift to us. And it's not a gift he had to give. He wasn't obligated to give us anything. And to be sure, it was a gift that he gave as a sacrifice. In sending the Son to earth, the Father gave up the sort of intimate fellowship that he had known with his boy. I mean, imagine, imagine if you will, just imagine sending your own son or daughter away to war. Imagine watching him or her pack up his bags and seeing him off at the airport. Imagine not knowing if you would ever see them again. Now, of course, God the Father knew that he would see Jesus again. He knew how the story would end. But just because God knew how things would go doesn't mean it wasn't a sacrifice for him, sending his one and only son to the battlefield of earth. Why would God do that? Well, it's who he is. At his very core, our God is generous. As the book of James says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. So in fact, the story of the Father's generosity is the story of Scripture. The story of God's generosity is, is our story. We exist by the generosity of God. On the first pages of the Bible, we meet a God who wants to give. He starts by giving us creation. He creates the earth and the moon and the sun and the stars and the land to cultivate and reign upon. God didn't have to do any of that. And then he created the nation of Israel and he gave them this land, this land flowing with milk and honey that they didn't deserve, that they didn't build. God didn't have to do that either. And then God gave them the law. He revealed himself to them and what he expected of them and what, what he defined as good and, and bad and, and true. God didn't have to give them that either. And then God gave them the temple, 
a place in which they could worship him and experience his presence and peer into the heavens. God didn't have to do that either. And then God gave them the prophets. God gave them men and women to speak truth to them and to remind them what his expectations for them were. God didn't have to do any of that. This is what we say when somebody gives us a gift. We're like, oh, you didn't have to do that. <laughs> God didn't have to do any of that. But he did it. Why? Because it's who he is. What's even more remarkable about this is that God gives us these things knowing that we would abuse them. He knew from the very beginning that we would not take care of his gifts. What have we done to creation? We've polluted it. What did the Israelites do to Canaan? They filled it with idols. What did they do to the prophets? They murdered them. Every time God gives us a gift, he takes a risk that we might break it, which we always do. If you're a parent, you know this. Every time I buy a gift for my kids, you know what I'm wondering? How long will this toy exist? <laughs> uh, I remember when I bought our kids uh, Nintendo DSs years ago. Anybody go through the Nintendo DS phase? Yeah, it's little handheld Nintendos. And <clears throat> my boys had a blast with these little handheld Nintendos. They took them everywhere they went. But they would just not take care of these things. They would leave them underfoot. They would, like, spill juice all over them. They, they would drop them in the toilet. They would crack the screens. They would lose the charge cord. That's us. God gives us incredible gifts. We just break them. Which raises a really interesting question. Given our inability to really care for the gifts God gives us, why would he keep giving us anything? Why would God insist on giving huge stacks of cash to people like us who just keep blowing it? In fact, here's the real question, though. Here's the real question. Knowing our history, why would God... Save the best gift for last. That's what happened. That's exactly what happened. God gave his people incredible gifts, each of which they ruined and abused. And so what did he do? He saved the best gift for last. He sent his son to earth. Why? Why, oh God, why? Why would he do that? Why would he think that we're going to treat this gift any better than the others? Was God being optimistic? That's like parents giving their kids Every version of Nintendo, seeing the kids just destroy it, and then saying, well, I've saved the best for last, the latest version of the Nintendo Switch. It's right here for you. Let's see what you do with it. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened, by the way. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. People enjoy Jesus as a gift for a while. They listened to them. They watched him heal the sick. But then Jesus started getting a little pushy. Jesus said some tough things they didn't like to hear. So what did they do? They broke him, hung him on a cross, broke the screen, dumped it in the toilet. Like every other gift God had given, they ruined this one too. Which brings us back to the question, why would God do this? Well, God knew something about this gift. He knew that we would destroy it. He knew that, but he also knew that that's what had to happen. Jesus even let it happen. The murder of Christ became something more than a tragedy. It became a sacrifice for our sins. You see, we're all sinners. God wants to spend eternity with us in heaven, but we're all sinners. That means we're not qualified for heaven. Sinners like us who live the kinds, the mediocre to average to terrible lives that we do, don't deserve to live in heaven. But God wants, wants us to live in heaven. God wants us to live forever with him, so he gave us his son as a sacrifice, knowing what we would do with him, but counting that as part of the plan. It's kind of like a Christmas present. I mean, what do you got to do? What do you got to do to get to a Christmas present? What do you got to do with the box? What do you got to do with the wrapping paper? You don't just got to open it. You got to tear it open. You got to rip it. You got to destroy it. I mean, I know a lot of you guys, when you're wrapping presents, you're like folding edges. You know, when you're measuring tape. You're doing military folds in the corner. You're measuring out. And then somebody, like just some kid, punk kid, just rips open the gift. Like, oh, oh, oh. That's us destroying the Son of God. Imagine God, oh, God, watching us destroy his Son. But he knew he needed to happen because of what we would find inside. 
what we would find inside. The gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of grace, the gift of peace. So on Christmas, we celebrate Jesus as God's gift to us, a gift that God knew we would destroy, but God accepted Christ's death as a payment for all our violence, all our sin, all our greed, all our lust. That's the gift God gives us on Christmas. Forgiveness in Jesus Christ. As the angel announces to Joseph, your wife will give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus because he will do what? He will save the people from their sins. Now what do we do with this? If Christmas is all about God's generosity and giving us a gift that we do not deserve, how do we respond? What do we do? Well, I can think of a few things. First, open the gift. Open the gift. In Jesus Christ, God is giving us a gift, the gift of life and salvation. It's a gift much greater than large stacks of money. As Paul says to the Corinthians, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, it can't be contained, it can barely be destroyed, but it's got to be opened. Now, what does it mean to open the gift? Well, it means to believe it. It means to declare it as true. It means to accept it as true. How many of us walk around with the gift of Christ without ever opening it, though? I know a lot of people who come to church without ever opening the gift of grace. Years ago, uh, my grandma Ruth, I've told you my, about my grandma Ruth. She was an amazing saint of a woman. Uh, she puts all other grandmas to shame, frankly, at the top of the grandma chart. But my grandma Ruth made all of her grandchildren uh, ceramic nativity sets. Here's a picture of her with all her ceramic nativity sets that she made for every single one of her grandchildren. Uh, these were amazing nativity sets. She spent all year making 15 complete ceramic sets, and she gave them to us on Christmas one year. And she showed us one set on Christmas. She said, I made one of these for, like, all of you, uh, and then gave us all the boxes. We each had our own box with a nativity set inside. What she didn't tell us was that inside each box, underneath the nativity set, was a crisp $100 bill uh, for each one of us. She didn't tell us about it. She just left it up to us to find if we opened the box when we got home. Well, some of us did. We got home, we opened the box, we looked at the nativity set, oh my gosh, oh wow, it's $100 in the bottom. Uh, some family members didn't. They just got home, like, okay, pfft, throw it in the closet, whether or not they even set it up next year. So they only found out about the money when they showed up next year and heard from everybody else what they had found inside. So, to this day, there are two kinds of grandkids in my family. <laughs> and we all know who's in whatever camp. <laughs> those who opened the nativity set and got their money, and those who put it in the closet and didn't bother and only found out about it later. My grandma, man, she was a shrewd old woman. <laughs> this is how many of us live out our faith, though. God gives us an indescribable gift in Jesus Christ, and we leave it in the box. We don't open it. We only find out about it with other people who open their boxes. And even then, we don't open the box. We don't get baptized. We don't join a church. We don't take hold the promise of new life in Jesus Christ. Why not? Because we want to have the gift without experiencing the gift. I'm speaking very directly to a lot of you in this room right now who want to have the gift of faith without experiencing the gift of faith. We, we suspect that if we open the gift, Jesus is going to kind of want to, you know, be disruptive in our lives. And, and to be sure, oh yes, he will. But in a great and wonderful way. We want to sing the songs and we call ourselves Christians and dream of heaven, but that's not how this works. You have to open the gift. You have to confess your sins and pray to receive God's forgiveness. You have to allow him to transfer, transform you into a new and different person. God gives us an indescribable gift in the grace of Jesus Christ, but we have to open it. Secondly, open the gift. We've got to guard the gift. Once we've opened the gift of Jesus... We've got to guard them in our hearts, uh, just like we ruin and abuse toys. We need to protect the gift of salvation so that we don't take it for granted. Like any Christian, we can drift away. As Paul writes to Timothy, guard, guard the good deposit, he says, that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. 
Years ago, I heard a news story about a rise in theft of baby Jesuses. Is that the plural of Jesus? Baby Jesai. <laughs> baby Jesai from uh, nativity scenes. So apparently baby Jesus is a very common target of thieves during the holidays. People consider it a fun holiday prank, right? Uh, it's on a lot of uh, uh, scavenger hunts, you know, uh, go steal baby Jesus. Now, now, of course, the owners don't think it's that fun. <laughs> and lots of churches actually have to find ways to keep baby Jesus safe. Some of them like chain him down to cinder blocks, you know, cemented into the ground. Some people chain him to the, the wall of, of the church. Uh, many churches are actually now ordering special Christ childs, Christ children, uh, which have been equipped with GPS tracking devices. <laughs> An actual product you can purchase on the internet, GPS tracking devices in the baby's backside. Uh, it, it seems weird, but it's actually led to the recovery of several baby Christs. So praise God for technology. <laughs> so baby Jesus is a hot commodity. People are always trying to steal him away. But this is true in our lives too. We have an enemy. I don't know if you know this. We have an enemy who wants nothing more than to rip the baby Jesus away from our hearts. He wants to distract us. He wants to lead us astray. The Bible says that this is what the devil wants to do. He wants to rip away from us the gift of salvation. As Jesus says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. With the help of the Holy Spirit, the gift of salvation is something we have to protect. If Christ is a football and we're playing in the NFL, the devil is all the linemen jumping up and down on top of us trying to rip and strip the ball away. The, the devil is the Rams. <laughs> right? Amen. <laughs> trying to strip. Oh, it's the Buccaneers. I'm not a fan of them either. Okay, this doesn't work. Every metaphor falls apart. <laughs> the devil is trying to rip and strip the ball away from us. And what do we got to do? We got to hold on to the ball. Now, how do we do that? How do we guard the gift? But well, we've got to prioritize the gift. We've got to come to church. I mean, we have to spend time with other believers. We've got to pray regularly. We've got to hold the ball. Now, I know it's not entirely up to us. God's holding on to us a lot more tightly than we are holding on to him. We're not the running back holding on to the ball. God's the running back holding on to us. God's not going to fumble us. If we get fumbled, it's going to be our fault, not the Father's. But that's why we still got to hold on. We've got to guard the good deposit. We've got to come to church. We've got to listen to sermons. We've got to pray faithfully with people who can hold us accountable. Guard the gift. And lastly, give the gift. To guard the gift doesn't mean to hoard the gift. The gift of Christ is a gift that must be given away. God only knows that we have truly received it if we give it away. He gives to us so that we can give to others. As Deuteronomy says, everyone shall give as he is able. According to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you, we have been blessed so that we can bless others, which brings us back to Christmas. Christmas is the season of giving. Have you been able, how have you been able to bless others with the love of Christ this season? How have you been able to bless others with the love of Christ this season? Now, if you've been hanging around Rooftop, you've had tons of opportunities, and it has been such a joy, earnestly, to see you join in. I mean, we have made tons of donations to the homeless this month. We are sending 60 people, helping send 60 people down to Mexico next week to furnish and build homes for homeless families down there. We boxed up dozens of gift packages for Operation Christmas Child. We are sending down dozens of Spanish Bibles to kids down in Mexico. We hosted all kinds of foster kids here for a party a few weeks ago. Many of you also opened up your houses to friends and family for dinner as part of our Christmas outreach. Our offerings are strong here at Rooftop. You guys are giving great. I have seen your generosity this month, and it is, it is a blessing to be able to pastor such a church filled with such radically generous people. But, but, will we be as generous in January, when January rolls around? Will we be as generous in January as we've been in December? Why wouldn't we? Christmas generosity should never end. Now, don't get me wrong. I hate his Christmas creep. <laughs> Right? I hate decorations going up in October and Christmas music that isn't confined to December. It is a rule in our house that you cannot listen to Christmas music in common rooms until after Thanksgiving. Consequences can be stiff. <laughs> Who's with me? 
Those of you who aren't clapping, you need to find a new place to worship. <laughs> but if Christmas is understood as God's generous gift to Jesus, to, of Jesus to the world, inspiring us to live lives of radical kindness, that's a year-round holiday. Besides which, when you come to understand God's generosity in giving us his son, when you come to truly understand that, it makes you want to give and not stop. I mean, in Jesus Christ, God didn't give us a stocking stuffer. God didn't give us, you know, the thing everybody wants this year. He didn't give us the deal of the day. God didn't even give us huge stacks of cash in the parking lot. In Jesus Christ, God gave us the gift of eternal life. He gave us the gift of forgiveness by which we can be free of our guilt and our shame forever. He gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit living inside of us to give us strength and hope to live well. He gave us the promise of new life in heaven with new imperishable COVID-free bodies. Paul is right that this is an indescribable gift and, and there's more where that came from. God has in store for us in heaven more experiences and blessings than we can possibly imagine. In the new heavens and the new earth, you and I will be holy kings and queens reigning over the new creation with Christ our brother. That's God's gift to us. It is indescribable. It is incomprehensible. It is unfathomable. It is unimaginable. This is God's gift to us. Given the riches that we have been given in Christ, why would we want, not want to bless others as much as we have been blessed all year long? If we're not giving the gift of Christ away at every opportunity, we have not understood the gift of Jesus Christ for us. So give it away. Give it away. You're not going to run out of it. Tell people about Jesus. Help the hurting. Bless the poor. Give to your church. Foster a child. Be friendly to a neighbor. Give cash to people in parking lots. Forgive people their sins. The opportunities to give the gift of Jesus away are endless. And God promises to give us what we need so that we can give to others what he's given to us. Open the gift. Guard the gift. And give it away. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Father, on Christmas we celebrate your, you celebrate your overwhelming generosity. We can't even comprehend it. Paul says we can't even describe it. To even fathom what you have given us in Jesus Christ and the birth of your son, his arrival. His arrival marks the beginning of your great plan, restoration effort to bring, bring death to an end to judge sin once and for all and to inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth, which are just around the corner. This is your gift to us. A place of forgiveness and grace and perfection. We have the power of the Holy Spirit coursing through us. We have the hope of the gospel. This is your gift to us. But we gotta protect it. And we gotta open it and enjoy it. And we gotta give it away. If we're not giving it away at every opportunity, have we even understood anything? Have we even understood the gift? Thank you for this opportunity to worship your son as our gift this morning, this, this afternoon. Help us know, help us seize the opportunities you give us at every chance to give it away to people in any form we can. Thank you for Jesus. He is your gift to us. Thank you for this evening. We pray these things in his name, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.